Inshallah, today we will start the, the book of Al Qada, which is the book of the judiciary. And this is the last, you know, the book of Qada and Kitab al Shahadat or the book of testimonies. That's pretty much the same uh, segment, uh, uh, same theme. So this is going to be the last segment of our Sharh al Umda or commentary on al Umda that is based on Imam ibn Qudama's book, al Umda al Fiqh, which is a Hanbali primer. Imam ibn Qudama died in the year 620 after the Hijrah. Anyway, he wrote those four uh, books in the Hanbali Mazhab. Uh, the first one is the Umda, the second would be al Muqna, the third would be al Kafi and the fourth uh, in order of uh, uh, basically vastness uh, would be Al Mughni. Um, so, inshallah, uh, today we will start Kitab al Qada or the book of the judiciary, and we will probably have four more weeks uh, to finish the entire book, this, in, this segment, and uh, the entire book, inshallah. Uh, Imam al Qadama rahimahullah ta'ala said here under the book of the judiciary, Kitab al Qada, wa huwa fardu kifaya, yalzamu al Imama nasbu man yuktafa bihi fi al Qada, wa yajibu ala man yasluhu lahu iza tuliba, wa lam yujad ghayruhu al ijabatu ilayhi, wa in wujad ghayruhu fal afdalu tarku. It is a fardu kifaya, the Imam must appoint enough qualified judges. Those who are qualified must accept the positions if they are asked and there are no others to replace them. If there are others who are qualified, then it is better for one to avoid it. Then it is better for one to avoid it. Okay, so Qada is Fard Kifaya, it's a collective or communal obligation. The Ummah will have to set up enough Qadis or enough judges. Uh, the Imam is doing this, he is the head of the authority, uh, so he represents the Ummah. The Imam is an agent acting on behalf of the Ummah. And the contract between the Ummah and the Imam is, is a contract of basically tawkeel. Uh, they, they made him an agent to uh, act on behalf uh, of the Ummah and, and uh, he's, he's hired uh, by uh, the Ummah uh, to perform the, in this role. So the head of the authority or his deputies, uh, because the head of the authority can't do everything, uh, the head of the authority or his uh, deputies take the same ruling. Uh, so they need to hire enough judges uh, because in, in Islam there is great emphasis on law uh, and a great emphasis on lawfulness uh, and keeping people from chaos and f from uh, transgression. Uh, this communal obligation uh, now, uh, so this is a communal obligation. The Ummah would be uh, in sin, all the Ummah will be in sin if there are not enough uh, judges to uh, basically enforce the laws and to uh, settle disputes between people and enforce the laws. Uh, if a particular person was asked to uh, be a judge or was appointed, then they must accept, uh, they must accept if there is no one else to take their place. If there is no qualified, like you are in a certain village or a certain town, the Imam commissioned you to become the judge. If there is no one else that is qualified to be a judge, then the ruling for you is that it is wajib on you you uh, must uh, accept, and that is no one else qualified. Um, someone else 
qualified. Okay, so he says here if there is no, there, there, there is like one of two, uh, uh, no, well, there is one of two scenarios here. Uh, one scenario, no one else is qualified to be a judge. Uh, one scenario is someone else is qualified to be a judge. In this scenario, no one else is qualified to be a judge. You must accept. But there is a little unless here. And you will find this in the larger books, uh, because the larger books will have more nuances and more details. So he says here, you must accept. But in the larger books, you'll have some more nuances. So you must accept unless it will keep you from something else more important. Or something like this. So if it keeps you from something else that is more important. Because at the end of the day, human beings are human beings. And they may have, what if this person uh, is, uh, is it, it, and it doesn't have to necessarily be so altruistic also. What if this person is a wealthy businessman and uh, he has a large family to uh, take care of and he's uh, unable to uh, basically dedicate himself to the position and leave his business. Uh, and basically, yudaya uh, ayalahu, and and cause uh, harm and uh, to his to his family. Uh, what if this person is uh, basically on track to become a mujtahid, and he's afraid that becoming a judge will uh, keep him away from you know further uh, learning and research. Uh, to reach the position of a mujtahid, for instance. Uh, although, should the judge be a mujtahid, that's a different story that we'll come to a little bit later. Uh, what if the person is uh, doing something more important, like, you know, uh, for himself or for uh, the community? And then in this case, they may, uh, they may, not, may uh, decline. Uh, the position. And in this case, the Imam will have to figure out a way to appoint someone qualified in that part particular uh, locality. If this is a communal obligation, though, who determines what that more important thing is, the community or the individual person themselves? Well, the individual person, because this is, uh, we're addressing the individual person here. When we say it's wajib on you, we're addressing him and we're leaving it up to him to determine whether uh, or not uh, he will take the, the job. So he will not be forced to take the job. Uh, although he can pressure him, he can't force him, but you can pressure him. Uh, but what if there is someone else qualified? What if there is someone else qualified? Then what do they say here? They say it is better not to accept the position. It is preferred for tarkuhu. If there are others who are qualified, then it is better for one to avoid it. So better to avoid it. Okay. So, and I think that there is much that we can learn from this. Uh, there is much that we can learn from this because, oftentimes, oftentimes. Uh, we uh, compete for those roles, uh, you know, leadership roles. Uh, and these roles are going to be a source of uh, disgrace and remorse for people in the hereafter. That's what the Prophet Wasallam said uh, when he said to Abu Dhar, to Abi Dhar, Ya Abu Dhar, inna ka da'if. So this hadith was reported by Muslim. The Prophet said to Abu Dhar, Oh Abu Dhar, you're weak. And certainly Abu Dhar's weakness was not weakness and piety. No one was more sincere than Abu Dhar, the Prophet himself said. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, so the canopy of the heavens uh, did not give shade to someone or the, the earth did not carry someone that is more sincere and devoted than Abu Dhar. So this da'af, this weakness in Abu Dhar was weakness in his ra'i in administration, in his reasoning, in his administration, in his management skills, in the skill sets that are needed for leadership. Uh, so he told them, you, you are uh, weak in this respect. And then he said to him, and it is a trust, you know, leadership positions, they are a trust. Uh, and it will be on the day of judgment a source of disgrace and remorse, except for one who takes it with a full sense of responsibility and discharges all his obligations towards it, fulfills the obligations of it uh, or the requirements of it. That's a huge responsibility that would make us step back from leadership roles uh, as much as, as we can. So when we are, you know, and, and the litmus paper test, because we don't also want pious people, because if all pious people step back and all wicked people step forward, then we will leave all these positions to uh, the most wicked in the society that have no concern about, you know, the hereafter remorse and the hereafter or anything. But a litmus paper test is that if you're doing it against your own desire, then you're probably, you're probably okay. Uh, you know, if you're not pursuing it out of your own desire, your own eagerness, you don't have that shabak ilayha, you don't have that craving for it. Uh, you're not craving it, but you say to yourself, I'm just going to need to do it. Uh, because no, you know, because I am the most qualified to do it, or something like this, uh, and I fear that people will basically uh, not live up to the uh, trust. So that is when you you should proceed and you should continue, but without fighting too much, because at the end of the day, one thing that also Islamists uh, in general fall in is that. Uh, basically, l lack of observing the Amr al kawni universal decrees that Allah is in control. And, you know, yes, Abu, Abu Bakr said, this deen will not diminish while I'm alive. And we want people to have that sense of responsibility for the deen. At the same time, we want people also to respect their calibers because we're not in the caliber of Abu Bakr, of course. We want people to respect their calibers, and we want people to you know, tie your camel, but put your trust in God. Keep your powder dry, but put your trust in God. So do whatever it is that you can do without agitation, without you know, uh, aggression, uh, which, which is something that we do see. You know, people that think that they can run countries, if you give them like a, a little masjid to run or a little organization to run, they fight, uh, you know, over it, and uh, basically they, they demonstrate the, the worst etiquettes uh, and the, the complete lack of spirituality, the complete lack of trust in God, and they think each one of each one thinks that they are Abu Bakr or they are Omar and uh, you know that they have to fight for the cause of God when they're fighting for their the cause of their ego uh, or uh, they are misguided not necessarily their ego they're misguided they really may think that they are it and without them things will crumble and you know things will fall apart which is almost always not true. Anyway, so uh, better to leave it, better to uh, basically decline. Particularly in qada, because qada also is, a, is an enormous responsibility. The Prophet وسلم, said, al qudatu thalatha. Uh, that is, you know, judges are three types, and this was reported by Nasa'i, or reported by, actually by Sunan, and, and Tirmidhi also, and Abu Dawood, and, and Ibn Majah. 
so this was reported by Sunan. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said that Qadatu Thalatha, judges are three types. Wahidun fil Jannah wa Thnani fil Nar. One will be in Jannah and two will be in their fire. Falladhi fil Jannah, Rajulun Araf al Haqqa. وَفَأَمَّا الَّذِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ فَرَجُلٌ عَرَفَ الْحَقَّ وَقَضَى بِهِ As for the one who will be in paradise is the man who knows the truth and judges accordingly. وَرَجُلٌ عَرَفَ الْحَقَّ فَجَارَ فِي الْحُكْمِ فَهُوَ فِي النَّارِ With regard to the other two, a man who knew, knew the truth but transgressed in his judgment, he will be in the hellfire. وَرَجُلٌ قَضَى لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى جَهْلٍ فَهُوَ فِي النَّارِ And a man who judges between people uh, with ignorance or upon ignorance, uh, he will be also in the hellfire. So if, if that ratio is scary, uh, so two out of three are in the hellfire. And it should make people uh, uh, certainly um, Reluctant should make people reluctant and hesitant to accept a position like this where you know that the ratio is not really favorable. Uh, so that's that. That's that part. Um, then the Sheikh says, وَمِنْ صَرْتِهِ أَنْ يَكُونَ رَجُلًا حُرًّا مُسْلِمًا سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا مُتَكَلِّمًا عَدْلًا عَالِمًا its prerequisites include being a free Muslim man with intact hearing, vision, and speech who is trustworthy and knowledgeable. Uh, so, free Muslim man, uh, you know, if uh, a person who is a slave, they, they can't have full control over themselves because someone owns them and the judge should certainly have full control over themselves, but the person who is a slave can be Amir Sariya can be appointed as the head of an expedition, can be appointed also uh, for roles that are less than the judge, although they may include some uh, judging. Um, and certainly, you know, he has to have eyesight, he has to have hearing, he has to be able to speak, he has to be trustworthy, and he has to be alim, he has to be knowledgeable. And does that knowledgeable mean that he has to be mujtahid? Initially they said that, but at the end of the day, where are you going to find all those mujtahid? So they uh, basically, because the principle here is, uh, you know, uh, so whatever can be done should not be basically uh, abandoned uh, because of that which is unattainable, because of unattainable standards uh, that, that we place in ourselves. So if we make a condition that the judge must be a mujtahid and we don't have mujtahideen, then we let the people just kill each other or you know, settle their disputes among themselves. So this is going to be a problem. Now, um, two issues I want to talk about, uh, and I do not want to forget uh, here, uh, the issue of uh, women being judges and the issue of, um, you know, having people judge without being judges, tahkim, because they are related to this point. So the judge has to have many conditions to become a judge. Uh, but. If we disagree over like $50 in the market, for instance, uh, will we always be able to pursue a judge, full-blown judge, uh, to settle the dispute between us? Or is there room here for the concept of tahkim? And the concept of, huh? Arbitration. You could say arbitration, yes. Uh, that's how we usually translate it. Um, is there room here for the concept of tahkim? There is room for the concept of tahkim. And it is related to this point because the, in the authorized view of the Hanbali Mazhab, that hakam or muhakam 
you know, uh, in the passive voice, muhakkam, not muhakkam. That muhakkam should actually meet the conditions or requirements of the judge, which ends to be a little bit self-defeating. Uh, because where are we going to find all those people? So that is why Imam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, said the muhakkam does not have to meet the conditions of the judge. If we're in the market, we should just find the most knowledgeable and most trustworthy merchant in the market and go to him. Uh, he may not meet the conditions and the requirements of the judge, but if that's the best option that we have, then we should. Uh, and in fact, you know, Jubair ibn Mut'im was late to accepting Islam. Uthman and Talha, Uthman and Talha are Uthman and Talha. They disagreed over a land swap that they made among themselves uh, in between Medina and Kufa, and they went to Jubair ibn Mut'im to settle the dispute between them. Yeah, uh, the, the, the chain is somewhat questionable, but the, largely accepted uh, by the fuqaha, this story. We have another story where Omar and Ubay, and you see the humanity uh, here, but you see also the piety. It's just like, it's beautiful. Omar and Ubay disagreed over the orchard. Uh, they had some disagreement in a transaction. Uh, just like Uthman and Talha had that disagreement about the transaction, which tells you that even the Sahaba, even al Ashram was Shroon Bil Jannah, they can have these disagreements. So Omar and Ubayd had this disagreement and they went to Zayd ibn Thabit uh, to settle the dispute between them. And this is one of Marasil al Shabi. Marasil al Shabi means the, the reports that the Shabi relates from. Uh, the Prophet or the Sahaba without seeing them. So there is a drop here, there is an qata uh, interruption between a Shabi and the people he is reporting from. And Marasir al Shabi, the, those reports uh, by Shabi are, are certainly better uh, than Marasir al Zuhri and Marasir al Hassan al Basri. So al Shabi was better in his Irsal, although still there is you know, controversy over Marasir, but, but largely accepted. That story is largely accepted uh, by the Fuqaha. Uh, the story of Omar and Ubay uh, pursuing um, you know, the judgment of uh, Zayd ibn Thabit. You could say uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, you know, of course Zayd ibn Thabit is known to be uh, scholarly, but Jubair ibn Mutam is not necessarily known to be scholarly. Uh, uh, and uh, the Prophet وسلم, also met a man by the name of Abu al-Hakam, and this was reported by Nasa'i. Prophet وسلم, met a man by the name of Abu al-Hakam. And he said to him, In Allah huwa al-Hakam, falimadha tukanna Abu al-Hakam. Uh, Allah is the judge. Why are you being called Al-Hakam, the judge? Why are you be co being called, uh, w why is your kunya Abu Al-Hakam, the father of Al-Hakam? And the man said to him, In qawmi idha akhtalafu fi shay'in atawni, atawni, faqadaytu baynahum faradiya alayya al-fariqan. Uh, my, uh, or fahakamtu baynahum faradi alayya al-fariqan. My people, when they dispute over something, they come to me and I set up the dispute between them, I judge it between them, and they, both parties would be pleased with my judgment. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ma ahsana hadha, how beautiful is that? Uh, and they said to him, so uh, what is the name of your eldest son? He, he told them, Shuraih. And he said to him, you are Abu Shuraih. You are Abu Shuraih. That is not the same Shuraih that became a famous Qadi, by the way, although some of the uh, great scholars uh, said that, but it, he's not the same Shuraih. Uh, the other Shuraih, has, his name is Shuraih ibn al-Haris, a different Shuraih. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the idea here is that this concept of a tahkim, this concept of arbitration, is a valid concept. Now, to not dumb it down all the way and not just water it down, the person needs to have some knowledge. You should try to look for the best one that is within your reach. 
you know, if you have a dispute, try to look for the best one that is within your reach without also overwhelming the most knowledgeable in town. Because if everybody would go to the most knowledgeable in town, you know, the, they would be overwhelmed. But you try to find the, the best one within your uh, reach uh, for this arbitration because Muslims should have that basically attitude. You know, if there is a dispute, let's find a third party. Let's find a way to settle that dispute, regardless of, you know, even if that dispute is between spouses. But let's try to look for someone to help us if we are unable on our own to figure it out. So the, the concept of tahkim, the concept of arbitration, and as I said, although the authorized view in the Hanbali Madhab is that the hakam, the hakam or the muhakam should meet the criteria or requirements of the judge, the Imam ibn Taymiyyah, which is the uh, stronger position, chose that the muhakkam does not have to meet those criteria, otherwise we will be, it will be back to square one. The other issue... I was going to ask, now, what about like specialists, like, for example, maybe a specialist in family law? Yeah, people can specialize in different uh, sections of the law, but I would recommend, and that's part of the importance of this segment also, anyone who does this, they need to read, they need to learn this section. It's about the da'aw al bayinat and how to establish proofs and you know which uh, claim to be heard and when, how to deal with the different claimant and defendant and so on and so forth. Uh, it is important for anyone who will do arbitration to be well versed in this area. In addition to the specific area uh, that that he uh, will be talking about or he will be judging uh, about. So. So yeah, that's important. And, and now the other issue that I also wanted to talk about is the issue of uh, women uh, judges, uh, because that is also a hotly debated uh, issue, just like all the issues that involve uh, women in fact, uh, they are hotly debated. Uh, but the issue of women judges, uh, let me give you a typology of positions here. And uh, so the Malikis, Shafi'is, and the Hanbalis said women cannot be uh, judges of any sort. Uh, the uh, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa said uh, women can be except in uh, penal law uh, like hudud and qisas. So uh, they can be judges in, in all matters except in, let's say, criminal law. Criminal law. And you have uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan, who is the student of uh, Abu Hanifa. Uh, plus al-Tabari. Uh, plus ibn Hazm. And those three said uh, they can be judges in all cases. They can be judges in all cases without exception. So that's the typology of positions. Uh, now, so what are they, why are they saying this? Where is this coming from? Uh, I have to tell you, uh, first, to, to defend you know, the positions, the mainstream position that women cannot be judges, because that is the mainstream position in Islamic law, uh, the position of three mazahib. Uh, also, Abu Hanifa did not say that they can be judges in all cases, he says, uh, except in criminal law. Um, so, the, the, to, to, to just put the things in perspective, they're not saying that this is because of spiritual deficiency, of course. 
and, and the proof on this, you know, they can't be imams for a particular purpose, not because of spiritual deficiency. They can't be judges for particular reasons, not because of spiritual deficiency. Because as we said before, when we talk about imam, uh, you remember in the chapters of Salah, when we talked about imam and said women cannot be imams for this and this and that, but this is not because of spiritual deficiency, because women can be muftis. And they have been. And there have been, you know, uh, in our history, uh, you know, uh, many, many, many women who were considered muftis. Now, who is higher in ranking? The imam, the judge, or the mufti? Of course, the mufti is higher than the imam and the judge. In fact, the judge refers to the muftis uh, when, when they are stuck. Where, you know, they ask the mufti questions uh, when they are uh, stuck. So the, the mufti is higher than the judge and the imam. Therefore, the fact that we allow women to be muftis uh, just completely uh, debunks the, the notion that they, they, they are barring them from being judges and from being imams for spiritual deficiency. It is untrue. Uh, in fact, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, clearly says in a Turq al hukmiya Wal mar'atul adl kar rajul fi sidqi wal amana wa diyana. And you will find this in your footnotes. Uh, I think you will. Uh, so the, the, the trustworthy woman is just like the trustworthy man in truthfulness, honesty, and religiosity. So it is not about spiritual deficiency. What is it about then? It is about the acumen. It is the aptitude. It is about being able to... Uh, and, you know, first of all, the judge has to mix with a lot of men and criminals and so on and so forth. And it's not appropriate for a Muslim woman to mix with criminals and uh, p people of, you know, such backgrounds. Uh, and sometimes the judge has to be with them alone and, and so on and so forth. So that is that concern. The other concern is that they also cite that women are emotional. And the fact that women are emotional does not mean deficiency in them, in them or defect in them. This is actually perfection because that is what they need to be. And when women try to be like men, they lose that. And then they lose their edge. They lose their advantage over men. You know, the idea that a woman can do everything a man can do is just a failed idea. It's just a bad idea. Because if a woman can do everything a man can do, then a woman will not be able to do everything a man cannot do. Uh, and that is, the, that is the whole thing. That's why we complement each other. Not because women can do everything men can do, because women can do everything men cannot do. And when they compete in the space of men, they lose their, their edge in their own space. Uh, they lose that tenderness, they lose the emotions, they lose you know, the femininity that is the matrix of life, that is the joy of life. So it becomes a problem because you will have, you know, you know, positive and positive charges. Uh, they don't, they can't be together. So you have to have positive and negative charges to be attracted to each other. Anyway, but, but that is the, 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 they cite this part that being uh, someone emotional and a judge needs to, uh, suppress uh, their emotions. Um, they also cite something from the Quran that that could be controversial. In Surah Al-Zukhruf, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "وَإِذَا بُشِرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِمَا ضَرَبَ الرَّحْمَنِ مَثَلًا ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ أَوْ مَنْ يُنَشَّأُ فِي الْحِلْيَةِ وَهُوَ فِي الْخِصَامِ غَيْرُ مُبِينٍ وَجَعَلُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ إِنَاثًا أَشَهِدُوا خَلْقَهُمْ سَتُكْتَبُ شَهَادَتُهُمْ وَيُسْأَلُونَ." 
So what, are, what do these ayat mean? وَإِذَا بُشِرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِمَا ضَرَبَ لِلرَّحْمَنِ مَثَلًا And when one of them is given the glad tidings of the birth of a female, that they had ascribed to the Most Merciful. They had ascribed to the Most Merciful that he has daughters. Uh, his face turns dark out of distress. Uh, is one brought up is one brought up in ornaments and uh, who's unevident in conflict in confrontation who is timid unevident unclear in conflict in confrontation to be attributed to God that's you know, that's the meaning of the verse according to the majority of the commentators. Uh, is one who is brought up in ornaments and is who is uh, unclear uh, in confrontation to be attributed to God. Now, certainly you don't attribute to God sons or daughters, you know. It's not like you attribute sons to God, but you don't attribute any of that to God. Uh, some of the scholars, by the way, uh, to, you know, uh, to be also uh, complete, some of the scholars said that this does not talk about women to begin with at all. It talks about the idols. It's the idols that they used to make out of hedia. They used to make idols out of silver. Or, you know, so they would get their ornaments and basically melt them and make idols out of them. So they make idols out of these ornaments. Uh, uh, that's of course, uh, you know, the idols are uh, unclear in confrontation because they don't speak. So it's, it's obvious. Some of the scholars said that this ayah refers to idols, it does not refer uh, to women. Uh, but anyway, uh, these are three different positions. Now you have this is the typology of positions. Now you have ijtihadat that would say that this is dependent, that this even, this, the, the, these fatawa are dependent on the circumstances at different times. Uh, because also the, the strongest proof on the side of the Jumhur is that the Prophet and his rightly guided Khalif has never appointed a woman as a judge. Uh, the, uh, Omar, it was said that Omar appointed a woman as a muhtasib. She would basically go to the markets and enforce laws in the market, market, but not as a judge. So this is the strongest proof on the side, their side. So some of the ijtihadat, and they actually build it on some talk, uh, even, um, you know, uh, Sheikh Ali Jama, for instance, when he talked about, and he's not particularly a friend of Ibn Taymiyyah, but uh, he respects him as a faqih, I guess. Uh, but when he talked about shahada, uh, women's shahada. Uh, all the new shahadat are coming out from Ibn Taymiyyah's, um, not, not only Ibn Taymiyyah, but mainly Ibn Taymiyyah because he's the one who was basically most prominent uh, and also most the, uh, sort of clear in his uh, arguments. So, uh, so Ibn Taymiyyah was talking about the shahada of the woman and the fact that the shahada of the woman, it, he, he inferred that it is circumstantial that because women were not, they did not have the business acumen, for instance, uh, to understand contracts uh, and to be witness to those contracts. Uh, contemporary scholars are understanding, or some, not, of course not all, but some contemporary scholars are understanding from this that when they have the business acumen, they can become. Uh, basically uh, witnesses and judges uh, for that matter.
anyway, that's just the basic, the, the, quickly the uh, different positions on, on this issue. Next, the Sheikh says, ولا يجوز له أن يقبل رشوة ولا هدية ممن لم يكن يهدي إليه ولا الحكم قبل معرفة الحق فإن أشكل عليه شاور فيه أهل العلم والأمانة Okay, he may not accept a bribe, nor may he accept a gift from someone who was not in the habit of giving him gifts before. He may not judge before knowing the truth, and if he has any difficulty, he should consult with the people of knowledge and trustworthiness. Okay, so a judge, of course a judge cannot accept a bribe. That's not the point, that's like a given. But he's still mentioning it. He just wanted to, to extrapolate from this and go beyond this. That oftentimes, you know, well, oftentimes judges accept the bribes. But, you know, we're, but uh, he wants to say that oftentimes judges accept gifts, or sometimes judges accept gifts which are disguised bribes. Uh, these gifts, a judge should not accept a gift except from someone who was in the habit of giving him gifts before. And it would be the same sort of type of gifts. So if your aunt used to give you gifts before, you become a judge. You don't tell her, no, I'm a judge now. I don't accept gifts. So you could take the gift. Although your aunt can be, you know, uh, one of your clients at some point, or, uh, a defendant or a claimant and, and stand before you at some point. A judge may not, a judge may not uh, adjudicate a case in which his spouse or uh, ancestors or descendants are party in. But a judge may adjudicate a case in which his aunt or his even brother is party in. Uh, he is barred from adjudicating cases in which his spouse, his ancestors, and his descendants. Uh, he can be a judge in, in such a case. Uh, but anyway, so he cannot accept any gifts except if from someone who was in the habit of giving him uh, gifts from before. He may not judge before knowing the truth. And if he has any difficulty, he should consult with the people of knowledge and trustworthiness. Uh, in fact, in the, in the past, they used to have uh, people from the different mazahib, like muftis from the different mazahib, attend with the judge uh, to basically give him counsel when he needs it. Uh, they were very polite, they would not interfere, but they would give him counsel on demand, on PRN basis, if you're in the healthcare field. So on demand. Uh, uh, and this is a good habit. And the judges, when they went to a town in the past, what they did is, you know, they, they were commissioned by the authorities to go to this town, to be the judge in this town. So they would go into town, but before they arrive, they would have sent to the scholars of this town. Uh, to, to inform them that they have been commissioned to be judges in this town. So that the scholars will go out to meet them with the rest of the people. They used to go out to meet the judge at the entrance of the town, at the gates or entrance of the town. So when the judge comes in for the first time, he's being received by people from the town, including the main scholars of the town, so that there is familiarity with them, uh, establish a baseline and have this familiarity with the scholars in the town. And then they would provide them consult. Certainly they would not interfere, even if they were more knowledgeable, but they would provide consult when consult Consult is solicited. Uh, so he w should consult with the people of knowledge and uh, trustworthiness. Then the Sheikh said, "Wala yahkum wa huwa ghadban, wala fi halin yamna ustifa al ra'i." He must not pass any judgment while he is angry or in any condition that will prevent him from fully employing his intellect. 
any condition that that is a polite reference to Jawan, uh, Haqin, you know, so, so he has to go to the bathroom, he's, he's too hungry, he should not pass a judgment. When he's too hungry, when he has to go to the bathroom, you know, he has to be able, he has to be in a condition, uh, uh, he has to have his equilibrium and be in a condition of just complete togetherness. He has to be completely together uh, before he passes a judgment. Certainly this ghadab is the ghadab that will impede, uh, cloud, confound your judgment. Not the, the, not the little ghadab or the minor ghadab that will not impede your judgment. Because obviously, you know, when you are in the midst of all of this and you have claimants and disputants and, and defendants and disputation, and you get a little angry sometimes. So, you know, people's manners are terrible. So you get a little angry sometimes, but that little anger is not going to cloud your uh, intellect. Then the Sheikh says, وَلَا يَتَّخِذُ فِي مَجْلِسِ الْحُكْمِ بَوَّابًا وَيَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ الْعَدْلُ بَيْنَ الْخَصْمَيْنِ فِي الدُّخُولِ عَلَيْهِ وَالْمَجْلِسِ وَالْخِطَابِ He must not use a doorman for the courtroom. That is basically to not pre to, to allow all people to come in, but certainly you know these things evolve with time. These things evolve with uh, time, um, and if there is a need for a, for a door man, then that is fine. But the concept is the concept is don't prevent people from coming in to basically complain and to seek justice. That is why he says, don't have a doorman. So allow everybody to come in and talk to you if you are the judge. But you could hire a doorman, but you could instruct the doorman to allow people to come in who have issues. Uh, and then he says that uh, he must treat the two uh, litig litigants uh, equitably in terms of admission into his room, seating, and the manner in which he addresses them and the manner in which he addresses them. Equitable treatment of the claimant and defendant or the two litigants uh, should be, uh, yeah, and this is basically one of the hallmarks of uh, Adab al-Qadi, the etiquettes of judges. He has to be even-handed. If he calls someone sir, he calls the other person sir. If he looks even, you know, there is a, a hadith that's controversial. Well, and he should be even-handed with them in his gazes and his words. So if he looks at someone in a way, he has to be even-handed in the way he looks at them and in the way he speaks to them. Um, completely even-handed in this respect. That brings us to the end of uh, the, for the first part, the first chapter in the Book of the Judiciary. Inshallah, after uh, a 10-minute break, we will start uh, the following chapter, chapter on the manner of judging uh, which is Bab Sifatul Hukm or court proceedings. Court proceedings. From the use of the doorman, what does that mean? Can you the Prophet said, uh, whoever, uh, whoever is in a position of, uh, whoever works for us as an agent and keeps himself, uh, means, uh, means what? Keeps himself from the people and their needs, did not listen to their needs. Uh, which means their distress uh, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not listen to him in his time of need and distress and so on. So this is uh, basically to tell people in these positions that they must not uh, bar 
the, the, the public from uh, seeking, uh, you know, justice or counsel or uh, so, so the bottom, uh, the, you know, the bottom line is, if you will have to have a security guard, uh, the security guard should be instructed to treat the people compassionately and to allow the people who have needs to come in. But at the end of the day, the, we have to also be pragmatic because in our times, you cannot not have security guards. Do you know that, you know, the three out of our four khulafa were killed because they didn't have security guards. Uh, so uh, two of them were killed in the masjid because they did not have security guards. So you could easily, anyone can easily basically reach out and kill them. And uh, that's three out of our uh, rightly guided khalifas were killed in this manner because they didn't have security guards. And Uthman refused to have security guards, uh, even when... Even when he was offered by Hassan and Hussein to be his security guards, and many of the Sahaba, he, he refused to have uh, security guards. That may be righteous, noble, this and that, but at the end of the day, it creates havoc. Uh, if the head of state will be killed, you know, with this ease, uh, it created havoc. It's not like it would. It did. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a quick question.